Okay, let's see here. Tulsi, Sergey, Tarek. Morning. All right, I think everybody's here. Okay, so a uh, brief conference today. We'll start off by uh, continuing our beginning of the year review of drugs. So today we'll go over uh, calcium channel blockers or class four agents. So when we're talking about the Vaughn Williams class four agents, we're talking about verapamil and diltiazem. Those are the two most common calcium channel blockers that we use uh, for arrhythmia management. Both of these agents work to slow the calcium channel cells of the SA and the AV node, but they also can depress automaticity anywhere in the heart. Um, and they decrease conduction velocity and increase refractoriness of both the AV node as well as the SA node. And for this reason, they're especially good for treating AV reciprocating tachycardias involving the AV node. And a classic example, of course, would be orthodromic reentrant tachycardia. Now, up until uh, the advent of adenosine, which some of you may not realize is actually a relatively novel agent for the treatment of arrhythmias. It really was only introduced like in the late 1980s. Um, like 88, 89. Um, so prior to that, if a patient came in in SVT, verapamil would typically be the agent used for quote unquote acute termination of a tachycardia. And um, so uh, doctors got very facile with its use. Um, there are a number of limitations for its use, but this was actually the most commonly used agent that is still reasonable, particularly for an older patient. Uh, so generally, um, most of the time, verapamil and diltiazem do not have direct electrophysiologic effect on atrial or ventricular myocardium, except that slow channels may be important to myocardial early after depolarization, which may play a role in certain arrhythmias, such as uh, Belhassen's tachycardia, which is a form of left ventricular outflow tachycardia, which uh, may explain why it is that calcium channel blockers can be effective for this type of arrhythmia. Uh, both of these agents are very well absorbed uh, from the gut, but uh, they're only about 30 to 40% bioavailability after first pass metabolism. And uh, very little is left when it's excreted in the urine. Um, for Apamil's half-life is about five to 12 hours, and Diltiazem's is shorter at three and a half hours. And both can be given IV, but for Apamil in general is... Um, significantly more uh, hemodynamically embarrassing on average versus diltiazem, which is why you don't see it used very often IV these days. And again, the most important concern when using verapamil is the, uh, the possibility of causing hypotension, particularly with a fast push. Um, verapamil comes as a uh, fairly concentrated IV uh, manage, uh, solution. And so it's very difficult actually in small children to give it slowly. It has to be very aggressively diluted and given very slowly. And um, the rare times that we've given it in the cath lab, no matter how slowly we try to push it in, the, in a central line, it seems like virtually everybody gets hypotensive when you're using verapamil. So you have to be very, very, very careful uh, when using uh, verapamil IV uh, to give it extremely slowly. And by slowly, I mean over like 10 or 15 minutes if possible. Um, diltiazem though can be given a little faster, but still has the potential to cause hypotension. Um, both agents will depress myocardial function. So you should keep that in mind when thinking about whether you use it in terms of your patient. Uh, and the most common side effect of the use of verapamil is uh, constipation, um, can cause dizziness, nausea, or headache. Um, and it can cause heart block, which is not surprising since it has direct effects on the AV node. Um, but this is most commonly seen in patients who already had some form of heart block beforehand. 
Uh, it's not common if it's given at the proper dosage to get heart block uh, in a person who has otherwise normal conduction. Some of the important drug interactions, uh, verapamil increases cyclosporin levels, which is an agent we don't use as much anymore, but rarely is used for prevention of uh, transplant rejection. It can increase theophylline levels, um, as well as increase carbamazepine levels. Um, similarly, uh, diltiazem can increase cyclo uh, cyclosporin levels, carbamazepine levels, and digoxin levels. And... Um, you know, I think it's important to remember that basically we do not give verapamil to children under a year of age. It's basically contraindicated. Um, and the reason for that is because in the early 1980s, there were a number of reports, late 70s and early 80s, on the use of this agent in babies, showing a number of examples of cardiovascular collapse with the use of verapamil. And some people feel that in retrospect, this may have just been reflective of the fact that the agent was given too fast, but because there were a number of reports of this, it has sort of become a thing and we don't give it to small children anymore. Um, and so uh, basically do not give verapamil to children under a year of age or perhaps even under two years of age if possible. Now, diltiazem, on the other hand, um, can sometimes be given to relatively small children. I would not probably give it to anybody under six months. I don't think there are almost any reports of it, but actually it was I who, uh, in the early 2000s, we reported our experience with IV diltiazem, and we did have one or two children under a year of age in whom the agent was uh, safely administered without problem. Um, but as a general rule, you want to be careful with with uh, either of these agents, but particularly verapamil is really an absolute contraindication at this point to give it in a child under a year of age. So uh, please, please avoid that at all costs. Similarly, both of these agents are absolutely contraindicated in the setting of Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome in that it may enhance accessory pathway conduction and potentially enhance the possibility of uh, life-threatening arrhythmias, particularly uh, rapid conduction of atrial fibrillation resulting in ventricular fibrillation and uh, death. Uh, for similar reason, uh, though through a slightly different mechanism, digoxin is also contraindicated in the setting of WPW. Now, the only um, caveats for this are that if you have a, par a patient who's in SVT, let's say you have a five-year-old in the emergency room, and for some reason there's a global uh, global problem with the supply of adenosin, and you've decided you want to use verapamil to stop the SVT, you would not know in a patient with SVT if they have WPW. So certainly you can use verapamil to terminate SVT or ORT in a patient with WPW, but it should not be used as a chronic agent. And obviously uh, if one is using it, a patient needs to be very carefully monitored. Um, digoxin on the other hand, um, we would never use to acutely terminate tachycardia. Um, as, you and, as we have discussed in this conference, DIG can be used uh, in children under a year of age. Most electrophysiologists feel, as do I, that there are enough other agents that probably you don't need to use digoxin in children who have WPW under a year of age. But a lot of older cardiologists might say that they've had very good success with almost no risk when using this agent in very small infants because of the fact that small infants are very, very unlikely to have atrial fibrillation. And so the theoretical risk of digoxin enhancing rapid conduction in the setting of AFib with WPW is probably overstated in a child who's under a year of age. That said, there are still rare reports of that. And so my personal bias, and I think that of most electrophysiologists is that there's enough safe agents to use in that age range that we would not recommend using digoxin and certainly never would use uh, verapamil. And there is no age range in which anybody would think other than for acute termination of tachycardia that verapamil or diltiazem are a reasonable agent to um, treat tachycardia um, chronically or prevent it. Uh, dosing of these agents, verapamil is given as uh, 0.1 to 0.2 milligrams per kilo as an IV bolus. I wrote here over five minutes, probably safer to do it over 10. You can repeat it one time in 30 minutes, uh, but again, not generally recommended in children less than two years of age. The maximum dose anyone should receive at any size is five milligrams per dose. 
And uh, for the oral dosing of this agent, it's typically given four to eight milligrams per kilo per day divided Q8. Um, so, you know, I guess a patient who we would consider using this agent in would be maybe somebody who has uh, tachycardia from AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. I think that would be a good indication for the use of verapamil. And we have rarely used that in older children who are not pre-excited and who maybe are uh, having side effects associated with beta blockade, which is usually our first line for that. Um, and then, you know, as I said earlier, the only really concern that we sometimes get is constipation associated with its use. Uh, it could also, of course, be used for the treatment of uh, idiopathic VT like uh, Belhassen's LV alpha VT, as we mentioned a moment ago. Diltiazem, um, there isn't really very much on this in the literature. Honestly, one of the only papers on it is still the same paper I wrote um, 20 years ago. And the uh, initial bolus is actually true for almost all ages, which is 0.25 milligrams per kilogram per dose, given slowly over five minutes. And then the infusion rate that we used in our work, and which has been repeated in a few smaller works since then, is 0.05 to 0.15 milligrams per kilogram per hour. Typically, I would start it at 0.05, and uh, if we have good effect, then move up. And this agent, in my view, is best used for AV block, um, to create AV block in the setting of primary atrial arrhythmia. So in our paper, uh, we never use this agent for actual treatment of SVT uh, or ORT, reentrant tachycardia is involving the AV node. In all cases, we use the agent for, pay for slowing ventricular rates in the setting of somebody who has a primary arrhythmia, whether it's atrial fibrillation, ectopic atrial tachycardia, or um, atrial flutter, it's a good agent for that. Um, remembering that the faster the atrial rate, the more effective this agent is going to be. In other words, if somebody's in an atrial tach at 110, it's unlikely that it's going to have a very serious, meaningful impact on the AV conduction. Um, the faster the AV, the atrial tachycardia, the more effective these agents tend to be. Okay. Um, very good. Any questions about those? All right. So we have a just a handful of unknowns today. All right, so question in this uh, tracing is, uh, what sort of pacemaker does this patient have? Uh, and I will ask, um, let me ask Dr. Kalis what she thinks about this. Um, okay, so I'm seeing a few pacing spikes and then P waves after it, so I think this patient is being atrial paced. Mm -hmm. um, Anything else? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out if it's sensed. Um, I mean, I, I see the pacing spikes, they come after a QRS, but I don't see them after every QRS. Hmm. Are you, um, what are you referring to? Like here? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to now teach you something. Of course, that's the whole purpose of this entire conference, but here. <laughs> uh, this EKG machine will put a small line between, as the leads change. Most EKG machines do that, so. Oh, I think, yeah. Okay, so yeah, this is going yeah, from lead yeah. two to lead L to V2. And you see there's a small little line that looks like a pacing spike. It's a little confusing, but uh, that's how this particular device works. So that's not pacing. So just to we'll make that clear. Um, okay. You can say that's all that you see there. That's okay. Um, or, or if you feel there's something else going on, feel free to tell, tell us. Um, I guess that's all that I see. I mean, I guess my only comment is that I do see P waves before the QRS, so I think the patient is being atrially paced. That's right. So this is, in fact, just a atrial pacing. So 
we would you don't really know what the program of the pacemaker is other than that the first letter is a right because when we you know we have the three letter system for pacing the first letter is the chamber paste the second letter is the chamber sensed and the third letter is the special function meaning what the pacemaker does in different circumstances so uh, this could be so-called AOO pacing where it's just pacing at this rate what rate is it pacing at Maya Pacing at about um, 100, about 50. Uh, I think it's closer to 60. 60? 60. Okay. So, yeah, so it's a pacing at a rate of 60. And um, now, interestingly enough, Medtronic pacemakers, which most is the most common brand that we use here and in most centers. Um, when they reach the elective replacement interval, they will pace at a rate of 60. So you have to check, to, you'd have to interrogate this pacemaker in order to determine if this is a sign of uh, uh, reaching the elective replacement interval, meaning that the pacemaker is telling us that the battery is close to needing to be re replaced, the whole generator. You know that we don't replace batteries anymore. We replace the entire generator because pacemakers are hermetically sealed <clears throat> in order to prevent the possibility of any battery leakage or contents of the pacemaker ever getting into the patient. And so there is no way to replace the battery. In in ancient times, like in the early 1970s, I believe you would actually replace the battery in a pacemaker, but we haven't really done that in probably 45 years. Um, so we just replaced the entire generator, uh, which is why that surgery is called generator replacement surgery. Um, now, do you think this is uh, a unipolar atrial pacing lead or a bipolar atrial pacing lead? Can you tell that from this tracing? Um, I'm not sure. I really don't know the answer to that. Okay, that's fair. We will accept that answer. <laughs> so, so when somebody is unipolar paced, so remember all pacing is uh, bipolar. By that, I mean, there have to be a positive and a negative pole and the electrons have to go from one to the other, from the cation to the anion, right? Uh, so it's always bipolar because you have to have two poles, you know, a positive and a negative. However, um, in pacing world, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, in the pacing world, if the two poles are on the very tip of the lead, we call it bipolar, meaning the cathode and the anode are both on the ends of the wire. Um, if, however, one is on the tip of the wire and we're using the actual pacemaker itself as the ground, instead of having the ground or the two uh, electrodes on the end of the lead, we call it unipolar pacing because there's only one pole at the end of the lead, okay? Even though in both cases, it's bipolar. In both cases, we have a cathode and an anode and the electrons are going from one to the other. Um, however, when the two electrodes are right next to one another on the end of the lead, Generally speaking, it creates a very small artifact on the uh, electrocardiogram. And so this is a very small artifact. Um, this would be highly suggestive of bipolar pacing in this patient. Um, uh, if it were unipolar pacing, you would typically see a very large uh, spike because of the very large surface area that the electrical uh, impulse is coursing between the tip of the lead all the way back to wherever the generator is. So it often causes a very, very large spike. Um, so this is typical bipolar pacing. And in 2022, it's very unusual for us to place unipolar leads. Um, the only time that we would probably place a unipolar lead in the present era is in a very, very, in a small infant, sometimes with the epicardial leads, they do come as uni or bipolar. So sometimes surgeon will place a unipolar ventricular lead on because there's just not a lot of um, real estate on the ventricle, you know? So in a small infant, if you remember our, our typical epicardial pacing leads are bipolar and there are two little pods, each of which has to be sewn to the epicardium. And in a small child, it might be slightly technically challenging for a surgeon to find place to put the two pods. So sometimes 
they'll put a unipolar lead on. We generally would prefer them not to do that. And honestly, in the three and a half years I've been at Mount Sinai, I don't think I've ever seen uh, Raghav or Peter ever place a unipolar epicardial lead. And that's because you usually can find enough uh, real estate to put them both on. And studies have shown that bipolar leads for epicardial leads particularly are more robust. They tend to last longer. Part of the reason for that is that if one of the two pod connections becomes poor, you can often reprogram the device to unipolar, meaning that even if one of the pods were to break, uh, or have a problem, you can sometimes still program around it and have the device still functional, whereas you wouldn't have that option if you only had a unipolar lead. Okay, So this is uh, atrial uh, bipolar pacing, probably AO, AAI, meaning atrially paced, second letter atrially sense, third level inhibit, meaning that in the setting of an atrial rate that exceeds the lower rate limit, in this case, the lower rate limit appears to be 60, uh, the device would not pace. Okay. All right, good. Good job. All righty. Uh, this is a post-op neonate after congenital heart surgery. And I'm asking you uh, what is going on and uh, would are there any changes to the pacing program that might be uh, useful or uh, helpful? So I think I'm going to take this question to Dr. Zawani who did an outstanding job this weekend on service. Thank you, Dr. Brass. Um, so what I'm looking at, um, I see a pacing spike before um, um, the, um, before the B wave and then there is no QRS. And then uh, afterward, the second beat we see, Basin spike, then the P wave, then the QRS, then again. So it's like, um, so I think given um, that we sometimes uh, are not uh, seeing the QRS following the P wave, then we have to make a change. So this is, uh, it sounds like a heart block. Um, is this complete heart block, uh, Tark? I agree with you. It is uh -huh. some kind of heart block that has uh -huh. seems to have occurred. Um, is how would you tell if it's complete or not, or can we tell from this if it's complete? Um, so um, I think I'll like you, yes. I'll give you a hint. It's not yeah. complete. So not how complete. would you how would you know that? So we can say uh, it would be complete if um, if we don't see any QRSs. Um, at all, but since we see intermittently QRSs, then we um, it's uh, it's not complete. Well, you would see some QRSs, right? Even if you had a ventricular escape rate, right? Like uh -huh. if you were in complete heart block, you might have a underlying ventricular escape rate of let's uh -huh. say I don't know, let's make a number up, thirty or forty. Okay. But as you said, there are QRSs, and we see that after some of the pace days, uh -huh. there do appear to be QRSs now. Uh -huh. It's possible that the QRS may be unrelated to the pacing, but but remember, this is a very important point. When somebody is in complete heart block on any given strip, usually the R to R interval will be relatively fixed within a few milliseconds. There will be very little variability of the R to R okay. interval. But in this tracing, right, we see here uh, actually there are three or there are four, mm -hmm. maybe even six beats here that are actually coming in at a, at a rate similar to the uh, paste rate. And then all of a sudden we have a couple of non-conductive P waves. So there is an irregularity to the QRS, uh, the R to R intervals that suggest that there is some conduction going conduction. on here. Now, let me ask you something. We uh -huh. just talked about, this is from the monitor of the patient. Uh -huh. We just uh -huh. talked about the fact that unipolar pacing causes very large spikes. Is this uh, unipolar pacing or do you have any other... Um, theories on why it appears as if we have these very, very large spikes on the monitor. Um, this is from the ICU. From, from the couple, ICU, uh, yes. From a couple uh, of months ago, actually. Um, so I so I think um, maybe from the um, from the ICU setting of the of the monitor, like mm -hmm. sometimes the pacing spike could look much bigger, right? 
Right. So this that's exactly right, Tarek. So this uh -huh. is the patient. The monitor has been set on uh, so-called pacemaker uh -huh. mode. Uh -huh. And the purpose of it is for the device to augment the appearance of pacing uh -huh. spikes to make it easier for the uh, medical staff, doctors uh -huh. and nurses and PEs, physician assistants uh -huh. to see the pacing spikes. Um, but it's interesting. You see here, it says that the heart rate is 134. Um, uh, is the heart rate 134 in the ventricle? Let's see. Certainly it's not. No, right? no. I mean, look at, look at just this R to R interval, right? This yeah. is way longer than a uh, heart rate of 134. What is at a rate of 134? Uh, uh, the 134, I think it's the uh, pacing. Right, it's the atrial pacing yeah. spikes. And so, you know, this is something that I have fought with. Uh, I used to uh, <laughs> joke with Dr. Ofori all the time about this, and uh, I still give Scott Aiden a lot of trouble, a lot of uh, big pain in the ass to him about this. I feel that this is not a safe way to have the monitor set up personally, because first of all, when you see a big complex like this, and you're just sort of looking briefly at the screen, you might be convinced that you're seeing a heart rate of about 134. But in fact, you're not. You're, you're seeing is atrial pacing at a rate of 134 with a ventricular rate that's particularly lower. Not only that, but look here, the monitor itself thinks that the heart rate is 134, when in fact it is not. Um, so I personally feel that although the theoretical benefit of having the uh, pacing spikes enhanced by the monitor is that it enhances understanding of what is being paced. I think that it actually has a tendency to confuse the bedside staff. And if you quickly looked at this, you just looked up at the monitor and glanced for a second, and you weren't sophisticated enough to understand that it was only pacing the A, and it says that the heart rate is 134, um, you might actually be delayed in responding to this. Okay, so now you've made this correct diagnosis, Tarek, that it uh -huh. is, uh, you're in heart block. So what would you do to the pacing program to uh, yeah. fix this? Yeah, I think um, well, it's not gonna be safe um, to leave the patient um, in this set, uh, this setting. So we have to switch to um, a DDD mode so we can have, um, um, like a base, a base, the atrium, base the ventricle. Yes, that's right. So you would immediately plug the V port into the device, into the pacemaker so that you have AV pacing. Um, okay. And then you would try to figure out why it is that the patient went into heart block. And yes. that's always interesting also. Um, yes. okay. Any questions on this tracing for anybody? I hope these aren't too simple for you guys, but I think sometimes going through these basic tracings is helpful because uh, these are the types of things that you sort of run into when you're rounding and up there in real time. Okay, uh, what is the underlying rhythm and uh, what is the pacing modality? So let me see here, who do we got here? Why don't we ask Dr. Molly Marshall? Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, first looking, the, just looking at the rate first is between like 65 to 70 or so. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's actually probably a little more than 70, but that's okay. Yep. And then so in terms of, sorry. I was just going to say, what chamber is being paced uh, or which the, chambers yeah. are being paced? Um, I'm seeing the spike before the QRS complex. So it's being paced in the ventricle, mm -hmm. ventricles. Mm -hmm. um, So, uh, and can you tell what the underlying rhythm is? Um, this is a harder question. Well, if I told you I was pacing somebody in the ventricle without even looking at a tracing, what would you think is the most likely rhythm that the patient has? 
Why would we uh, normally paste the ventricle in anybody? You have um, the, some, some type of heart block you could. Exactly. You would usually, it's because you have some form of heart block. You would mm -hmm. want to, uh, you know, so is there evidence that this patient has heart block? I'm going to answer to you that it there. It looks like it does because the PR interval on some of the complexes looks pretty long. That's right. And in fact, but the most important thing is there's no real relationship between the P waves and the QRSs, right? So mm -hmm. here we see a P wave that appears to be like if you saw just this complex, you'd say, well, maybe this is a sense V paced rhythm, right? Mm -hmm. But then here we see that the PR interval is longer. And then here the P wave is kind of falling yeah. just between them. And what we, we, if you watch it closely enough, you start to get the sense that there actually is in fact no relationship between the P waves uh, and the QRSs. Similarly, the uh, atrial rate, the, the P to P interval is actually faster than the R to R interval. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is uh, an example of some form of heart block, probably complete heart block. Um, and uh, because we would have thought this P wave probably would have conducted if somebody had normal conduction through their AV node. Uh, do you think that this is a uh, unipolar or bipolar pacing? Mm -hmm. In the ventricle. So are these large or small pacing spikes? They look large, but I'm just thinking from our prior conversation of how it's usually not unipolar sometimes. Right. But in fact, <laughs> this is actually this is actually unipolar pacing. So okay. uh, I'm, it's my trying to trick you guys. <laughs> so it is unipolar pacing because sometimes what happens is, you know, especially for ACHD patients, it's not uncommon that we have. You know, here's the interesting thing. When I started my career, which isn't really that long ago, 20 years ago, there were very few uh, thin bipolar transvenous leads. So a lot of surgeons would, and in, in that era, surgeons would put in transvenous pacemakers and they would often put in unipolar pacing leads. And uh, leads, you know, sometimes if you're lucky, your pacing leads will last a good long time. And so a lot of these patients still have the same pacing leads that they had from 20 to 40 years ago. So this is an example of somebody who's just being V-paced through a unipolar, old unipolar lead, which seems to have had a very good uh, a good run. And then another uh, little trick I'll teach you. So the question is like, which chamber is being paced? We see that the morphology of the QRS is a left bundle. So when you see a left bundle, typically that's a sign that you're pacing the opposite chamber, the right ventricle, which is makes sense because in a transvenous system, of course, we would only pace the right ventricle, not the left ventricle, because of the fear of uh, embolism and all sorts of stuff like that. So, as well as difficulty of getting in there. So, this is uh, RV pacing. Uh, it, we see that the QRS is uh, positive in the inferior leads, which suggests that uh, probably the lead is sitting in the outflow tract, um, not in the apex of the patient's right ventricle. Some people believe that pacing in the outflow tract may be associated with uh, less ventricular dysfunction. Um, but in reality, that is probably true, but it's hard to know for sure in any given patient what the optimal location is to pace. Um, so this is a VVI pacing at around 75 um, in a patient with some form of heart block. And I think with that, we'll stop for today uh, since I'm on service and have a couple of things to take care of this morning. Thanks so much for joining and uh, hope everybody has a wonderful day today. And now let me ask you, are you guys interested in doing a Thursday makeup for last week? Do you have time yes. this week? Absolutely. Okay. Yes, so, sure. we'll do, so we'll do uh, hemodynamics on uh, Thursday. Okay. Thank you, Dr. All right. Thank you very much. Thank See you. you in a little while. Thank you. Bye-bye.